Lord, enable us to accept burdens that come on us for your sake. May faith in you and faithfulness to our calling be more important to us than any comforts or connections in this world. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so I get the whole Joe over nine minutes after eight for all that. Just kidding. All right. Introduction. Um, Does somebody like like to read? We'll we'll just go on and we'll take turns. Um, And if you don't want to read, just say pass and we'll we'll go on to the next person. Um, Melissa, will you read the introduction for us? Patty works as a job placement coordinator for a business school. In order to secure jobs for all the program's graduates, Patty's supervisor suggested she pay their resumes, add their resumes and grade records. Patty refused, saying it was against her principles. The supervisor insisted she do things his way or she be replaced. When she still refused, he fired her. Have you ever had to give up something in order to stay true to your Christian convictions? So has anybody anybody have a story or an experience with something like that? But in what way? In what way? Well, I like I don't work as much essentially. You know, I take um, for example today uh, I could have worked like way more hours, right? Mm-hmm. But I decided not to, to be here. Okay. Yeah. So I've had I've had I've had similar jobs where you know you ask off for Sundays or you ask off certain certain days you, you notice that your hours get cut. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Work from that so you get the idea. Yeah. Like Facebook. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody have any similar examples? Where you're asked to do something, it doesn't have to necessarily be at work. It could be in any yeah. kind of situation. People you uh, associate with, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, friend is like so. Friends, maybe you start. Uh, you know, you stand up for something that you believe in, and all of a sudden, you notice that your friends stop calling you as much. Maybe. Yep. Or you walk away from a conversation they're having at the spy house because it's just inappropriate. Yeah. And they all kind of give you a weird look, like, "What's this problem?" Yeah. Good. Anybody else have a situation like that recently in the past? Well, there is a there is a continuance of the story. So in the in the leader's guide, it uh, states that that a week later, uh, when the president of that business school realized that Patty wasn't there, he started to ask about her. And then when he learned that she had been fired, he wondered why. So. Uh, because he knew that she was one of their best employees. So when he investigated the matter and found out that why she was fired, um, he ended up, the boss, the president ended up firing the supervisor and gave Patty the supervisor's job. So well, she, the story is make yourself needed at work. Yeah. That doesn't always happen, but I'm, I'm glad it happened in this situation. <laughs> All right. So um, studying God's word and carrying Christians carry a unique set of burdens. So there, down there, I'll read this little section. When rains flood a town, both believers and unbelievers end up with water in their basements. When drought parches a region, lawns and farms dry up, dry up without regard to each person's religious beliefs. Christians and non-Christians alike suffer from sin's side effects. I think maybe you think you all should have talked about that last week or in the week before. But Christians also have other kinds of burdens to bear. So early in the fourth century, a series of edicts by Emperor Diocletian commanded that Christian churches be torn down, scriptures be burned, and any who persisted in the adherence to Christianity be locked up so they would offer sacrifices to pagan gods. The historian Eusebius reported innumerable multitudes of Christians were imprisoned in every place so that there was no room left for those condemned for crime. Prison overcrowding was relieved only when a further edict commanded torture and death for any prisoners who would not honor the gods. So first century Christians in the Roman Empire could have avoided many problems if they had denied their faith in Jesus, but they confessed Christ and became victims of persecutions. Uh, When we follow Christ, there are special burdens that come on us, and we call them crosses. And this reminds me of the, anybody see the, I can't remember the name of the film. Um, it's about the missionaries that went to Japan. I can't remember the name. Maybe like 
six years ago, seven years ago it came out. Anyway, there's there was missionaries from the Catholic Church, and they were sent to Japan. Uh, and Japan was Buddhist and Shinto. And so uh, during that, it was uh, the missionaries had a lot of persecution where basically they were uh, basically forced to either deny their faith or they were tortured there or killed right there on the spot. It was very similar. Silence. Yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah, silence. Yeah. It's a good movie if you haven't seen it. Um, it's got, what's the guy, um, take, the, the Taken guy? Yeah, Liam Neeson. He's, he's in it, and I'm trying to remember who else is in it. It's a good movie, but it's very similar to that. It was a recent story, I think, in Australia, where a family and prison kids were put in prison for having a Bible in their house. Adam Driver's on it. Yeah, it was. Was it a two year old? I didn't get all the two year old was in prison. The whole family was put in prison. Yeah, I had a Bible in their house. Another example would be like this more recent. Uh, would be like during the Soviet Union, where mm -hmm. there was uh, like a ton of martyrs that were sent in the gulags. It's actually one of the reasons I didn't know. Um, you know how the um, Orthodoxy has an icon wall? Mm -hmm. the reason why the altar, it's one of the reasons why the altar is still behind the icon wall, because the Soviet Union would let them keep the church and the icons as like history, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't actually let them worship there. So they had to do it in secret. Uh -huh. So like behind the, in yeah. the closed room? You know, we, we deal with little persecutions here and there in this country. At times you hear about it happening, but it's nothing like what happens in our country. No. We've got freedoms that they don't even come close to other countries. Absolutely. So, so blessed to be here in America. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, let's dig into scripture. So we'll start in 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have using one of the Bibles on the table, it's page 1850. We'll read verses 12 through 19. And um, if you want to read... Um, until whenever you want to stop, and then we can just pass or play. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, then we're starting with Peter. I believe this is Peter. Mm -hmm. right. Gotcha. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery um, ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice. And as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a um, murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer, as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is in time for or it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not agree with us with God? And if it, if it is hard for the religious to be saved, the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Uh, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faith, uh, faithful creator and continue to do good. All right, thank you. All right, we're on, was it page two? My, my page is different. We're on page two. We just read uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. And we're on question one. So those of you who came in, you can answer this question. I'm just kidding. Why, why should we not be surprised if we suffer rejection or ridicule on account of Christ? Well, uh, it's not mentioned here, but it's one of um, We had a sermon about this. Yeah, about the whole idea of that's, that's evidence that Christ is here. Okay. So being persecuted is evidence that Christ is 
evidence that crisis is in us, that we are part of this. Okay, awesome. He said we would. He said we would. Uh, I don't know the verse, but he said it. <laughs> Somewhere in Matthew. I can't remember. Yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. Um, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you to be out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Anything else? Why why should we not be surprised? I feel like several things like throughout the Bible, right? He didn't say anything would be easy, he didn't say what to be like, he didn't say, you know, none of that is stated necessarily in the Bible. Mm -hmm. As simple as uh, pick those who don't pick up their cross and follow me, you can't be. Yeah, it's, uh, the idea of a Christian life is one supposed to be easy. Or what it is. Yeah, if you follow me, pick, take up your cross um, and give up, give up yourselves or something, something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Satan's going to use whatever method uh, means necessary to attack us, right? So be it through someone else, or you know, and that's the thing. It's not going to be easy for us in that way. Yeah, uh, Satan. One of Satan's main goal is to tear down God's kingdom. Then it, it would make sense that he would um, target us in particular uh, to try to to tear down God's kingdom. There's a, um, in the leader's guide, there's a little story of a, uh, of a <laughs> student who went off to university a little afraid of what others might say about his Christian beliefs. And when he came home for Thanksgiving, his parents asked him how it was going. And he said, great, no one even knows I'm a Christian. <laughs> so what, what, what connection with this, with what Peter says, what, how, is that, how are that, that story and this passage connected? You shouldn't have your Christianity in fear of persecution. Um, right. Um, you know, we're in a simple world and difficult things are going to happen to everyone and certain things are going to happen to us because we're Christian. But, right. Um, it's easy to say, you know, what was me? I'm Christian. I can't do, I can't. I shouldn't pass it up work. I shouldn't cheat on my taxes. I shouldn't, you know, we're not under such persecution that we're, not, um, you know, we're fearing for our lives. But it's almost like we're set up for those persecutions because we have, you know, if it is death, then we go to heaven. If it is persecution, we have someone to turn to. If it is, you know, ridicule or uh, or being marginalized or isolated, you know, um, we're already equipped with Jesus walking hand in hand with us. So, and you know, Jesus put his disciples on that boat that day um, in the Sea of Galilee when a storm came up. He knew everything, and he knew a storm was going to come up, um, and he never promised it was going to be easy um, on easy street. But he equips us with believers and with his spirit every day so I don't like I don't like it when people say you know it's really hard hard being a Christian or it's really <clears throat> life would be so much easier if I didn't have to do these things or I could just go the way of the world where everyone else is doing what they want but it's really not it's really you know it's the exact opposite I talked to a pre-service pastor who said it's really, really hard doing this. Yes, it is, but what is the alternative? It's doing it without Christ and God in your life. So, mm -hmm. no. yes, there's challenges, but good grief. You know, we have a, you know, we're walking around with a lion by our side, and we can't um, act like we're not. That's good point. Okay. What's the worst going to happen? It takes us home. Still.
still, I would not want to be in that situation. No. No. All right. Question number two: What should not be the causes of Christian of a Christian's suffering? Um, anything like criminal? Yeah. Yes. So, so anything anything sin related. So we don't. Um, you know, any there is no honor in suffering because we've acted sinfully. So. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a Christian it's not a cross um, to bear the burden of something that we did sinfully or to bear the consequences of of sinful actions necessarily. Uh, question three: Reread verses seventeen and eighteen, and in your own words, what is being said in those verses? <clears throat> We can take it verse at a time, so we can start with verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So what does that mean in your own words? Well, God is judging us, and we have to face God's judgment as you know, as His children, and we're still being, you know, subject to His judgment. How much, how much more so is are the people who don't have, you know, God know how much more so are they going to have to face His, his judgment? Okay, yeah. Makes you look at it and go, This is the first kind of a reminder like, everyone's going to be called to judgment, you know, everybody. So, we everyone needs to be ready. And if we believe in God's graces, but we know we're not perfect either, but we do have God on our side, I feel like other people who do not believe. And sin without repentance have, uh, you know, a different type of fear. Right, <laughs> way worse. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it kind of helps to understand this verse. Is what, what, how does God use suffering for Christians? It's growth. Okay. That's growth. Um, it's a reminder to live to Him. As our mind, yeah. Right, to keep us focused on uh, on Christ and what's really important in, in life. Absolutely. I think, it, I think it can keep us all grounded and humble through the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let us not get too comfortable here on earth. Right. Mm -hmm. So those who have no faith in the gospel have nothing to refine or purify, uh, as opposed to Christians who do have something to refine and purify. And so if um, non-Christians don't have anything to purify or to refine, essentially they'll, they'll be burned up. Um, there's a verse from Zechariah in chapter 13 um, where it says, God brings judgment in the form of suffering to purify um, faith and trust like gold passing through fire. And so if there's nothing, if there is no faith in God and in Christ to purify, then Kind of like to um, Paulina's point, it's, just, it's going to be way worse for unbelievers. Uh, what about verse 18? It's kind of a similar thought. Will be greater in this in a 
in a tiny sense, you could use the parent analogy of saying, who is, who's going to get in more trouble, the child who's followed the parent's directions or the one who didn't, right? Right. Okay. I also think that this, this verse, and he, here he's quoting Proverbs chapter 11, but it also reminds me of um, where the disciples asked Jesus about, you know, how many times should we forgive somebody? And um, Jesus says, or they ask seven times, you know, thinking that that was a huge number. And Christ says seven times seven. And they like, you know, were shocked. And, um, you know, how is this possible? Well, with God, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. That kind of reminds me of this, you know, it's just how, how difficult, how, for, you know, in our comprehension, how difficult it is for us to, try to comprehend, the, you know, the entire sins of the world being forgiven um, and how difficult, how monumental of a task that is. And yet if it's, if it's that hard for the righteous to be saved, just how, how much more, how much more difficult or how much more um, worse it will be, you know, is those for, to those who are not uh, believers. Does that make sense? I don't know, I struggled with these two verses and studying for this. But <clears throat> you might have anything else to say? I think too, like because we're talking about burdens, it's saying our burdens are gonna be heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have this this resource, we have God. Uh, how much harder is it for the people who don't have God that we can lay back on them? Yeah, the that's a good way to, that's a good way to put it. Peace from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you kind of look at it like, you know how people relate and say, well, we all have our struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has their thing that's a challenge, right? Right. So it's how you handle it. And if we have God and that's how we handle it, you know, then that we can see the difference. That's better for us. I think about a lady's house that I just left and the difference with her her having a strong faith in God and hearing the news of the death of a loved one. I came to her house and it wasn't a tearful, mournful place because she had faith in the Lord. So it's kind of, it's, it's a different walk, a different journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good. A different reward, right? Yeah, that's a good illustration of that. Good. All right, question four. What should we do if we suffer for the sake of Christ or our Christian principles? And here, look particularly at chapter, uh, verse 9, 19. I mean. What now? Be thankful. Okay, be thankful. Why? Um, he's refining us. Okay, yeah. We can rest, we can comfort in knowing that that he's doing whatever whatever burden that we're bearing, it's for our good, right? So we can be thankful. What else? What else should we do if we suffer for the sake of Christ? Praise God that you bear that name. Praise God that you bear the name. Oh, I, when I read this, um, Earlier this week, I wondered if he was referring specifically to, um, you know, in Acts when they they were told to stop uh, preaching preaching the gospel by the temple, and then the um, uh, the Jewish leaders took them in, beat them, um, beat them and harassed them and let them go, and then they considered themselves what I can't remember what exactly the verse says, but they considered themselves unworthy to be beaten in the name of Christ. Uh, when I read this, I wondered if he was remembering back to that uh, when he said this. Well, verse 9 says we should be offering hospitality to one, one another without grumbling. So I'm wondering if when we suffer, we should be offering support to others who are also suffering. Yeah, and well, um, <laughs> it's actually. I, I agree with you. <laughs> I was laughing not to put another canvassing moment on it. But we're walking in the heat of the day, and I'm like panting up this hill and get to the door, and I and I say, "Thank you, God, for this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for allowing using me, and then to support Jordan 
<laughs> we struggle with that. We struggle. Okay. I'm talking about Jordan. Yes, trying to support the others with you. Like, <laughs> give thanks to God and supporting <laughs> others in that direction. No. And then continue, continue doing good. And like, continue, you know, don't stop, you know, in the face of suffering, but continue doing good, knowing that you're doing the right thing um, and trusting that God will always strengthen and protect you to keep doing right. All right. Uh, his word in my life. Um, you mustered the, does everybody have this? Okay. You mustered the courage to join. This is a scenario. You mustered the courage to join your church's evangelism committee. After several weeks of training, you feel ready to hit the streets. Going door to door, you first encounter, your first encounters are tolerable, even somewhat pleasant. Then you come upon an angry unbeliever. He curses at you. You religious nuts make me so mad. He screams in your face. You th- think you all have the answers and can tell the rest of us what to do. After several more accusations and expletives, he tells you to get off his porch. Do you A, quit canvassing and quit the evangelism committee? B, come back later and slash his tires? Car tires. (laughs) Uh, There might might be multiple answers. We need to go back past those streets. (laughs) <laughs> or C, go on your way praising God for the incident. Thanks. You know, and, and I want to say, talk on this, like, thinking, thinking God for the incident, right? It was an incident for you. It was also an incident for him. Maybe it may eat at him or her and give them thought to think about what they just done. And maybe it will be some guilt on our conscience. Um, but, you know, today I had somebody kind of under me today, and I just said, thank you. You know, have a good day. And we, I mean, mm-hmm. but, you know, when those times come, and then we'll, you just kind of thank God for that time that you're still out, you know, you go to the next door. You remember uh, that you're a tool, right? And the Holy Spirit works through you. You're just the vessel, right? Right. It's God's work on His time. So you give thanks for the opportunity and hopefully it strengthens you as you approach the next right. door or opportunity. But it can be, to speak to the other side of it, it can be quite discouraging, mm. right? Or it's it likely will be. Yeah, and it's <laughs> discouraging. Like your heart more so is painting for the person who is right. where they are. Yeah. At. You don't come back, you don't smash his tires. Thank you. But it's you know, it's never easy taking taking verbal abuse from another person. It's uh I wouldn't say it happens on a regular basis to me in my job, but it happens frequently and it, yeah. it never really it never gets easy. It just, it just never has. Um, I want to dig into that. Doesn't have to be at all. Later, we'll talk later. <laughs> but I'm like, wants to know to the anger side or to the. So I've approached it from different avenues. So my natural, my natural uh, reaction is to hit back as hard as they hit, but you know. But you're prayerful. Yeah. I've I've tried, you know, I I've tried to take that route and kind of, you know, stand my ground. It it doesn't work. It it doesn't do anything. No. Um, I've only you have to know your audience. I've only ever had had this happen to me once, right? But like my mind would read it like I'm like philosophy, like more in the philosophy. That's how I got in that's um, initially how I got into religion. A lot of Anyway, we're not going down our level. Well, anyways, what I'm trying to say is, is um, I usually it interests me, right? Why, why would you have the thing to say that to somebody, right? Um, so like, that to me just like makes want to spark a conversation of like, well, what, what makes you say that position, right? Right. Yeah, and I, you know, and I tried to in situations like that, I tried to, I tried to put myself in the in in the other person's she used, so to speak, um, try to figure out why are they so angry, but, you know, 
That'd be nice. Sometimes that doesn't work. Why are they swinging? <clears throat> Sometimes I, you know, I, just, yeah. I don't have an answer. Well, it's not. It's like, what? Why do you have the have that belief, right? Because like, if, if you're either both atheist and theist, right? Right. It's both. There's both like mystery to it, right? Mm -hmm. We have these confessions that we live by, and they have the confessions that they live by, right? Right. But there's no way for, for, for them, at least, to know for sure that their confessions are, are the truth, right? Okay. Um, if you get what I'm trying to get at. So, like, why would you have this sort of, like, mindset that, like, that just shows me supreme areas. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, to add, so, like, what you're trying to say, too, is if you're as confident as I am, then why turn to anger? Like, right. why don't you find peace in what, you're, what it is that you believe if yeah, you're right. so confident about it? Yeah, and you know, in this particular situation, there there has had to have been some sort of past experience that made that person mm -hmm. so angry. Um, but at that moment in time, it's probably not the best time to kind of delve into that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if if there was a situation where you could get the person to calm down and actually have a conversation, I there's probably an interesting backstory that explains 99% of the of that who go that extra step in moments like this. Mm -hmm. Like I've watched Vicar kind of take on like this. And sometimes that's really incredible. And maybe it doesn't get very far, but it, it's really cool to watch them kind of try to, how they handle situations that are right. like this. Um, so come canvassing. Yeah. <laughs> There's your advertisement for canvassing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Did yell that, but oh, yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. I'm kind of new to this, but can I? I'm going to stress in this correctly. I'm trying to keep the judgments here, but there should be a D there. You should be right. According to what the story you just gave in this, D should be for number two. From the little story that's given, I've never seen one. When Leota saying that God said I'm supposed to go out and do that, they took it upon themselves. Oh, I'm ready to go. Right. And God told them to go. So if they get confronted in that that issue, and it wasn't God telling them to go, that they took it on their own initiative, then they're in sin. Which comes back to number two on unrighteous uh, <clears throat> suffering. Because if you didn't, if you when you walk your path, if it's not God telling you to do that. If you're doing it on your own accord, it may sound good. Right. But if you're not doing it because God told you to do it, then any suffering you're 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 acquiring is is sin because God didn't tell you to do that first. Jesus said, I do nothing unless the Father told me. Right. Yeah, I mean that's, that's a good distinction. That way, I'm not perfect at it, I definitely fall short. But in your in the scenario here. Nothing saying that God told me to go out and start witnessing. It just said, "Oh, I think I'm ready, so I'm going to go out." And then I, I come come to that that uh, uh, scenario, and there should be a D there, and ask God for forgiveness for putting myself in this situation. Right. Well, I would. Um, so I think there is. I think you make a good distinction between suffering versus suffering from for the sake of Christ versus suffering from. Um, you know, one's everyday decisions that go through the course of a day. Uh, I think there is a difference. Um, in the in the but in the scenario of actually witnessing and spreading the gospel, I would say that it, that it, that is something that we're asked to do um, on, in in Christ's name to to spread the gospel. Absolutely. Did, did Jesus spread the gospel to every everybody? No. He went where God told him, and where he went, that's when he spread the gospel. He didn't take it upon himself to, to go here and there, wherever he chose to go. He submitted himself to what God told him. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Sure. And, but even he was rejected, too, even where God told him to go. And that's righteous rejection. Sure. And, and remember that it's not for our works, it's for his. Right. And and. and you know, I'm out why am I here at Kevin today? It's not for me, it's for him. You know, I'm doing this for him I'm, I'm for the sake of and also, you know, to get souls, to collect souls, to, to maybe 
take with me to heaven, you know, and it was all the works for him and not for me. I, just, I don't deserve any credit at all. Right, and we so, look at uh, the Great Commission, right? Where God does give, well, where Jesus says, go and, you know, make disciples, right? Um, we have to listen to those words. We listen to anything that God did, so, right? So, this is a moment where he's telling believers to go and, and spread the good news, right? So, and that's for all of us. So, whether it's knocking on doors, whether it's sharing with your coworkers or your neighbors or your family members. Well, and, and it look it can look different in different ways, yeah. right? Uh, and, and and then you want God, you know, you hope that people can see that it's working for you. I'm, I remember going to campus one time and there was an older guy, a knock on his door and, and his wife, little did I know his wife had passed like a year before or whatnot. He was very still he was sad about it, but he was also blaming God. And so um, he wasn't mean to me. He was very nice to me. He just said, I, you know, thank you for this. Uh, but you keep your flyer. He said, I'm not being an owner or anything. I, said, I just, I don't believe, he's, he, I don't believe in God because if there was a God, he'd never done this to me. And I tried to talk to him a little bit. I could see that he was showing a lot of pushback. And he went back with me again. And believe it or not, I saw him like two years later. I mean, he'd come back to the same neighborhood. He was out front. He, he was still the same way. I, you know, no need, still the same. You know, I'm not changing my mind. You know, you know. But you never know. You hope to plant a seed. You know, you know God plant a seed for you. There was a um, thing I was going to mention just came to my mind. Because actually, <clears throat> I, I don't mean to keep up, keep, keep bringing up the Eastern Orthodoxy, but I, I, do, I did read a, a lot about them at one point. Um, and from it was, um, the church fathers in Eastern Orthodoxy, we were reading a thing about this is that when somebody commits sin against you, you pray to God for forgiveness that they, that you were the cause for the sin. That that's the uh, that it's good and right to do so. I remember reading that, and I thought that was a profound kind of thing. Okay. All right. Well, anybody have anything else on this first part? Do y'all have the f focus on the key point? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you might want to read that. Okay. Charlie, you want to read more? So, can you go get the key point? Yep. Okay. For in the name of Christ, makes us targets of animosity. Those who reject Christ will reject us. That is that cross we bear. Our Father is suffering the world's wrath. We go against God. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of one who is struggling with soul and body of God. Matthew 10, 28. Mm -hmm. All right, a Christian's attitude towards burdens is unique. Uh, Joe, do you want to read this next sure. portion? Mm -hmm. Two men shared a hospital room at the cancer treatment center. Both men had the same disease. Both were receiving experimental treatment as their last hope. One man was bitter and resentful. He never smiled. Family members visited only for short time because he was short-tempered and mean. He lashed out at them in frustration. The other man was calm and in good spirits. He would laugh at jokes, sit up as long as he could to play with his grandchildren and engage in conversation with the nurses. Faith makes a difference in how we bear burdens. Christians have a unique mindset that allows burdens to be borne graciously. All right, so the first section talked about how the Christian's burdens are different uh, and unique from the rest of the, than the burdens that we um, get from, from being living in a sinful world. And then the second portion looks like how we, our attitude towards those burdens. Um, we'll read uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Uh, and it is page 1788 in this Bible on the table. And again, we'll keep, we'll keep going around the room. Uh, Dennis, do you want to read or do you want to pass? All right. All right. Uh, chapter 4, verses 10. Yeah, and you can stop whenever you want to stop. 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord. At last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I know that it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, uh, or no, who gives me heart. That it was God of, of you to share, or it was good of you to share in my trouble. Moreover, you, moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with, with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you. Only. Or even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is, is, is that more, sorry, more be accredited to your account. I have received full payment and have more, uh, more than enough. I am am amply sub. Uh, supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent and <coughs> the gift that you sent. They are fragment, op uh, fragment offerings and acceptable sacrifices pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, uh, be glory forever. Amen. All right, thank you. I apologize if I'm the side. You did a great job. Thank you. All right, question number one. What was the situation in which Paul found himself as he wrote to his church friends in Philippi? He doesn't say it outright, but... Or does he say that? No, he doesn't say it outright, but can you catch what's... Or does he might know what's, where, where he is? He's in prison in Rome. So this is after he was, um, he appealed to Caesar and he was uh, taken to Rome to await his uh, trial. So he's there in, in Rome. Uh, question number two, Paul says he was content under, content under those circumstances. How is that possible? Yeah, I mean, sitting in jail, it does make you wonder how. I mean, I think he had to have his faith had to be strong. And and to have no know that God was there with him. Mm -hmm. So it all. If you think about the jails too, they don't like the ones out today where they have heat and air conditioning. I mean those were rock walls. Well, I think I think actually he was in it's like a house arrest kind of so I don't think he was in like a dungeon. Um, I think he was living in somebody's I think it was basically like a house arrest. Okay. As far from what I know. But still, I mean, he could, you know, he was, you know, tethered to there, couldn't go anywhere and well, yeah. by himself. You know. They didn't have any, like, we have modern day today. <laughs> right, right. A whole different lifestyle than you're stuck in a house for, you know, I can't, I don't know what time of year it was. I can't remember. But mm -hmm. Completely different circumstances. That sounds like God's providing for all of his basic needs. Right. And uh, spiritual needs. He's got people providing him encouragement. Uh, gifts, supplies, um, and then also the Holy Spirit's replenishing his faith as he goes through all of this. Right, and then that kind of gets at a later question, but is is that trust? Trust that God, God, He's there for you know for a reason. God has Him there for a reason, and God will take care of Him uh, to give Him what He needs. Um, I think also he he sees in in the imprisonment it's an opportunity for Paul. What if, what if, what opportunity do you think Paul sees in, in this? It makes me think twice. Yeah, it right. How how so? Could draw himself closer to God. What about all the people he's yeah? 
yeah, draw them closer to God. I mean, the fact that he appeals to Caesar, I mean, he's going to have an opportunity to basically proclaim the gospel to 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 the Caesar himself um, and to all the, you know, the other Roman dignitaries and uh, officials there. So, well, I think he knows, too, you know, God put him where he wanted him at that moment, you know. And, and that's for each and everybody. I mean, he, you're where you are because this is where he wants you. And um, especially doing what he's doing. I mean, like he touched lives in there that had he not been there, those lives, they would have never, you know, known. I mean, Absolutely. So the crosses of Paul are well documented. You know, he was riding high, um, you know, super well educated. Um, had money and steam, and then Christ converted him, and everything did not get better for him. No. You know, he was always questioned, um, you know, aren't you the guy who used to kill Christians? He was shipwrecked, he was in prison, he was beaten. Um, so this is not his first rodeo with trouble sure. um, for the Lord. Yeah, Dennis? Throw another whole thing there when you talk about faith. Just when, once we're in heaven, what need have we of faith? Well, faith will be realized at that point. Right. And thank you. So, with that said, Paul was thrown off this horse. He saw Jesus. Okay. As far as whether God exists and he saw him. He's walking beyond faith. I'm not saying that he didn't have faith for other things, mm -hmm. but that man walked beyond faith. He had a knowledge of who God is that most of us never have. Sure. I say with all the disciples, yeah. 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 you yeah. can say the same thing. Absolutely. And, and, and what it comes down to is our personal walk with God. We, we start walking in a relationship with Him. And when we do that, we have. We have less faith when I say that of things that are going on in our lives because we know that God's in charge of our lives. So it doesn't, when we walk in that faith of God is with us and we know it, and, I, and I, when I say know it, it's not faith, it's we know. Right. Just like, like Paul knew. When we have that relationship, when things come our way, it's nothing to us. It's nothing. Yeah, uh, that's a fair that point. Yeah, and I, I would agree completely. And I think that's part of what, that's part of how our attitude should be different towards towards burden, burdens because of that. Yes, sir. Uh, what about question three? Compare Paul's attitude toward to from what you would expect from a normal or an average jail inmate. How is his attitude different? It seems obvious, but so don't overthink it. <laughs> yeah. He gives thanks. Like, you're in this terrible situation. He gives thanks. I don't think that you would see that from an average jail inmate. Yeah. So, what do you think? What do you think the average attitude of a of an of a set of a jail or prison inmate is? Hey, what am I going to get? Anger. Out? Yeah. He. He had a teach that Anger, trying to, you know, escape, trying to get out of the situation. Um, on the other side, it could be a hopelessness or despair uh, of being where you are as well. Um, Everybody else's fault but mine. That's, that's another one. Yep. But all of their hands are grateful no matter where I'm at. About every range of emotions except the one that Paul showed. Right, yes. right, right. So, Absolutely. All right. Question number four. Note what the Philippians had done for Paul during his difficulty. So I think, Melissa, you alluded to, you mentioned part of this. How can Christians, and then the second part of that question, how can Christians help each other keep a positive spiritual attitude during times of suffering or persecutions? I think Paul did that today. Um, she does it during our church, but she talks to the lady, and the lady was talking about she just had a Pass and just her encouragement to her. Uh, I think she, even after she got through talking to her, she said, This helped me. This, this really helped me. 
I've heard you tell when it came up. I know. We all need reminders of the gifts and what is waiting ahead of us. Thanks to Jesus, right? Right. And just the encourage, encourage not fellow Christians. And as Christians, we can get lazy. Mm -hmm. We can, you know, you know, I don't think I need to go to Bible study today. Let's just stay home and watch TV. We just watch it, but, you know. Right. I'm saying, I'm saying like, if you can, I'm just saying like, I'm saying, sure. I'm saying like, it's just a moment where you decide to just not do it, you know, and you got to push forward if you move forward. And, um, it's, it's not always going to be easy. Right. And think about how much of an encourage you, by being here, how much of an encouragement you are to the others in the room. Um, because I think we've probably all been to a Bible study where it's, you know, pastor and maybe one or two other people. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's that in itself can be discouraging. But, you know, when there's lots of us, you know, and you're seeing, seeing people that you want to see and need to see and when they're all here, you know, we're all an encouragement to each other. And I know they want to see me. Absolutely. <laughs> just calling no, You're no, just attached. No. <laughs> but um, do you think that the Philippians, do you think that they, in their letter, that they sent a bunch of gripes and complaints about how wrong, unjustly Paul was being treated? Or what do you think? I don't know, maybe. I mean, yeah. I hope you're doing okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, does does does, a, does the pity party ever really work? No. <laughs> it, usually, it usually does. That. The ice cream uh, tastes great. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, and I think in the passage, you know, it, it points to like concrete help that they offer. You know, they sent actual gifts. They sent uh, Aphrodite's. I hope that's how you say his name. I have no idea. They sent, you know, they sent a person actually up there to, you know, in support of friendship. You know, they took actual concrete steps instead of just writing them a letter saying, oh, man, you, you shouldn't be up there. It was wrong what they did. But good luck with that. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, I think that's that's part of the, the point that the question is getting at is that, you know, when we have when our fellow Christians are, you know, in a time of uh, suffering or, or having a difficulty, you know, it, what concrete things and that we can do to help them through the, those burdens, I think, is is what's trying to get get a get across here in this in this section. I think it's as simple as presence, like what you're saying, like just coming and being here. Well, what did what did Job's friends do when he lost all of his? They just sat, right? And they didn't say a word. They just sat there. And so. Be so much like, yeah. you know, we think about that when we gather. Christian fellowship just to have someone sit and then also how good is God that really you both can leave uplifted you know mm -hmm. like even if you came to do the uplifting you both leave with a great feeling of you know, being uplifted gathering around that word absolutely well we are out of time I, I'm, I was just kidding about holding you over the nine minutes um, but I will read I re will read the summary real quick and then we'll close with prayer um, frequently imprisoned severely whipped and beaten on numerous occasions pounded with stones until nearly dead fleeing from riots and death threats shipwrecked three times does this sound like the life of a happy contented man I got my got a warm for me Thanks. when the apostle Paul told of these those experience, he wasn't complaining. He was boasting, praising God that these things had happened to him. Paul was happy and content in his life, even when suffering miserably, even when being persecuted for his faith. Faith is what made him able to endure all things. God's strength sustained him. God's integrity guaranteed hope. So, well, um, that's pretty much it. So if you want to do the, I guess, the homework there, you got those Bible verses, you, know, you can... You can keep learning through the whole week. All right, let's close our prayer. Right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to dig into your and dig into your word and to be together to study your word. We pray that that when suffering and persecution go is put in our way, that we're able to bear those burdens for each other and for ourselves by having by 
and strengthening us with the faith in you. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.